Welcome to Socrates in the City in Seattle. Yes, listen, uh, you're wondering how this happened, all right? The question is, what am I doing in Seattle uh, besides this? Well, here's the bottom line. I was invited to speak in Alaska. I've never been to Alaska before. Uh, and you know, for a New Yorker, Alaska is very exotic. And so when I was invited to speak in Alaska, uh, my daughter, who pretended not to be my daughter just a moment ago, uh, she and I thought we're gonna go uh, to Alaska. And I gotta tell you, um, I, I said, are there any direct flights from you know, New York to Alaska? And there aren't. And so I said, well, can you get me a flight through you know, like West Palm Beach? And you know, these travel agents, let's be honest, they don't want to work, okay? Uh, I, I don't think she tried. I don't think she tried. She made it sound like the only way you could get to Alaska is to Seattle. And you know, I was, I was tired of arguing because people just don't want to work these days, okay? So, uh, so I found out that in order to get to Alaska to speak there this Sunday, uh, I would be passing through Seattle today. And I got this crazy idea. I said, hey, hey, maybe that would be a good time to have a Socrates event. <laughs> Turns out I was very wrong. Um, I thought, wait, who can we get? This is, this is extraordinary. And I have to tell you, for quite some time now, I've wanted Michael Medved to be my guest at Socrates in the city. Um, the problem is we would have to do the event on a Friday night. Turns out Medved is a Jew. <laughs> not, just, not just a Jew, but an observant Jew observes this thing they call the Sabbath. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so the fact that he agreed to do this is he's even more gracious than he normally is in agreeing to do this tonight. He's going to be whisked away from here uh, by rickshaw, I believe, is the, uh, <laughs> that's the biblical. Okay, in scripture they use rip, rickshaws. You can look up the, the, the original word, it's rickshaws. Anyway, um, why are we in this club, uh, in this hotel? Uh, about 12 years ago, uh, I was invited um, to speak to Seattle, and they put me up at this uh, hotel, and I was so enamored of it, I was stunned by it, I wandered up to this room, and I said, wouldn't it be amazing to have a Socrates in the city event in Seattle in this room? And here we are. Um, now, we don't, we don't have time because the sun is setting and the Sabbath is arriving. We don't have time for me to go into the glorious history of this club. But since we are on the subject of Jewishness, I have to tell you, I can't believe this is true. It's something I would make up. Sophie Tucker. Most of you don't, you don't know who that is, but Michael, I think, might know. Sophie Tucker was called the sweetheart of the Arctic Club. She doubtless performed right here with her risque red fox type humor. And it's unbelievable to me, uh, literally every bathroom uh, in the rooms here has a picture of Sophie Tucker. So I just thought, this is, I feel like this is meant to be. I'm schwitzing, you know what I'm saying? Um, all right, what is Socrates in the City? At Socrates in the City, we've been doing this for years, most of you know, we ask the big questions. The big questions, what are the big questions? Those are the questions that you, know, you don't talk about at a cocktail party. Certainly not in Manhattan. I don't know about maybe Seattle, you're a little more thoughtful. But the big questions, questions like, does life have meaning? If it does, what would it be? What is the meaning of life? Uh, and can I make money off of it? Uh, questions like that. No, we, ask the, we do ask the big questions. Tonight, we're sort of asking the question with Michael as my guest, does history have meaning? If there is a God, uh, does God operate in history? Uh, does God, uh, what does it mean to be chosen by God? Um, so we ask um, the big questions. Uh, what is time? Are you my mommy? <laughs> you know, the, are you mama? Uh, we ask, we, we, we have fun asking the big questions. And I think we're trying to create a culture where we ask, so if you go to our website, we ask the big um, questions as much as uh, possible. Now, I just have to tell you, um, the particular reason that I'm excited uh, to talk to Michael Medved tonight, uh, a few years ago, I read a book called The American Miracle. I was not less than astonished by this book. 
not just because of what it says, principally because of what it says. Uh, it's called The American Miracle, Divine Providence in the Rise of the Republic. It's, it's, it's a masterful uh, compendium of things in our history, American history, that cannot help if you are rational, but be viewed as the result of divine providence. And if you have another theory, I'd love to hear it. Um, but it really is an extraordinary book. Uh, and I think it's important um, to talk about it. And I, I happen to know the author, Michael Medved. And so, and he happened to be free tonight for a little while. He's done a million things, and I don't know where to start. Uh, he has a three hour radio, pro radio program daily. Um, uh, he's the author of many other books, a number of which are truly extraordinary. Um, he was for uh, over a decade um, on TV, host, co-hosting sneak previews. So uh, he, um, you know, he's that, the triple threat, right? TV, radio, books. Uh, he's widely considered the Jewish Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, <laughs> except, except once Sammy Davis converted, you know. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. is now considered the, the Jewish Sammy Davis Jr. So, so that, that title has been ripped away from Michael Medved. Um, I, uh, I have to say it's a great privilege to introduce my friend, Michael Medved. Michael, please. Hello, hello. Thank and you I for can't coming. believe you, you got both Sophie Tucker and Sammy Davis Jr. in the introduction. That's, uh, I never mentioned Elizabeth Taylor, you'll notice, or Don Rickles, but that's, uh, that's for the next Socrates event. Um, Michael, 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 listen, um, I, uh, I try not to gush too easily, but when I read the book, I didn't say it in my introduction, but the substance of the book is astonishing, and we're going to cover that. But the writing of the book, I'm a writer. And most of the books that I read that have important information in them, part of me feels like, I wish I could rewrite it a little bit. Your book is gloriously written. Thank you. The sequel to it is gloriously written. So I just wanted to say that um, up front. So before we get into the details of what are these miracles in American history, I guess the question that I have had as I've been reading, rereading the books is how did you come to know these magnificent stories? Because I was uh, astonished not to have known most of them myself, to discover them in your book. How is it that you found yourself discovering these almost unbelievable but true stories? It started with my dad. Um, and uh, because my dad's story was unbelievable. Uh, my, my, my dad's story, to put it briefly, my, my grandparents were from Ukraine. And uh, my grandfather came over to earn enough money to bring his wife and his six children over from Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, by the time he had earned enough and sent money back so that they had steamship uh, steerage to come here from Bremen, uh, World War I had just begun. So my grandmother and her father and six children were riding in the train, and then they came to the border with Austria-Hungary, which was a combatant, of course. It's World War I. And it's September, right after the guns of August, no passage. They had to go back. Uh, my grandparents were separated for 10 years. And uh, my grandmother lost five of her six children uh, because of uh, the, the violence and the revolution and the civil war and the, and the horrors. Of, I mean, the, one of the fine books about that part of the world is called Bloodlands. This was, uh, this was a place where the horrors of communism were first visited. In any event, she came over to the United States. She reunited with my grandfather after 10 years of separation. And then immediately she got sick, uh, and badly sick. And she became very concerned about her own survival. 
She was unable to keep any food down. She was 50 years old. And uh, she had seen so much death with her five daughters, my, my aunts, as it turns out. But they, she went to the doctor. And she told the doctor of her symptoms. He examined her. He said, sit down. I have to talk to you. And she started crying. She said, why are you crying? She said, it's a tumor, right? She said, no, it's not a tumor. It's a baby. <laughs> And she said, not possible. I'm 50 years old. My husband is 50 years old. He said, your name is Sarah, isn't it? <laughs> um, and my, my dad was so aware of this story because his older brother, the other only survivor from the Ukraine, my uncle Moish, I was 21 years older than my father. My dad always viewed his life, the fact that he was born in the United States of America in Philadelphia, as a miracle. Uh, my dad was born in the sesquicentennial year, 1926. My grandfather, who had been born in Ukraine, was born in 1876, the centennial year. My dad was the most natural, spontaneous patriot because he understood that everything he had, everything that he had achieved, was a gift from God. Because he, he could have been together with his sisters, who he never knew, who died on the other side. And my dad was born in Philadelphia. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia. Now you're making this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I remember being three years old and my dad taking me to see the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. And we went to Valley Forge. And when I was six years old, the first time they allowed me to go trick or treating, uh, I dressed up as George Washington. Uh, I, I mean, this is. This has been a lifelong obsession. And honest to God, I think for anyone to be seriously read American history, and I majored in American history at Yale, uh, and to not recognize that America is no accident, that you talked about a purposeful universe. America is a purposeful country. And not as a reward for our goodness, but because we have been chosen as an instrument. It's what Abraham Lincoln says. I write in the book about Lincoln speaking to the state legislature in Trenton, New Jersey, not too far from Philadelphia, uh, that uh, Lincoln described America as the almost chosen people. And not chosen for special privilege, but chosen for special responsibility. I was, that was a, w one of my questions. Um, you know, what does it mean to be chosen? When we talk about uh, Israel being chosen, uh, it doesn't mean you win a prize. It means you've been given a burden, a tremendous responsibility. And it seems inescapable when one reads y your book that um, America has been chosen, like it or not. Uh, I've written about this myself uh, in, a, in a couple of books, but it comes with tremendous responsibility. Um, and uh, but I, I, I wrote a book called "If You Can Keep It," where I mention a few um, of these miraculous things, which make it seem unavoidable that America right. is, you know chosen by God uh, for his purposes in history. But when I read your book, I, I just couldn't believe how many other stories, extraordinary stories, you had discovered. What was that process of discovery? Because I really do mean that it is almost unbelievable how many of them there are in this book and then crazily in the sequel, which, <laughs> which goes on and on. It, it, how did you? How did you find these stories? Well, they're stories, they're stories I grew up with. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, again, I, I, I've been obsessive compulsive about this stuff my whole life. I mean, I, uh, the, the one board game was a board game with the presidents of the United States. And uh, basically, and 
And it, I, I used to do tricks of memory when I was a kid, and I don't have all the stuff anymore. It doesn't stay, but memorizing the secretaries of the treasury and the vice president. Well, who doesn't and, know them? Right? <laughs> we can all we can go down the room. We all know. There have been some pretty all great. All the way back to Sam and Pete Chase. Right. Well, to Alexander Hamilton and Albert Gallatin. And, yeah. Uh, in yeah. any event, uh, so uh, again, this is this is. You're something basically saying you're a freak. Yes, that, that's like absolutely. the explanation. You're a freak. You know all this stuff. No, I and, mean, and and it's also because if you are sensitized to it, I'm one of those people, and I know you've had these conversations with many of your other guests. I, uh, my father was always, and my mother, uh, were always conscious of God uh, in terms of two countries, America and Israel, and uh, the. Uh, and, and it was something that they felt deeply, but they weren't conventionally religious people until much later. And when I began to become more personally religious uh, in my t early 20s, uh, it, it just, I began to start looking for exactly what you're talking about those proofs that, that something is very weird here. I'll tell you one of the proofs, one of the stories in this book is uh, about how it is that uh, America, well, got, for better or worse, the state of California. And, and uh, a, a, great, a great deal more. And it's, it's, it's mind boggling. No, it, look, it is mind boggling. It's why I got to tell you, you've got to read the book because you won't believe it until you read it. And, and that story, I mean, tell it if you can because no, no, it's I, just, I, just uh, briefly, it is unbelievable. Briefly, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, which was the treaty by which uh, Mexico and the United States ended the Mexican War. And America agreed not to do what a lot of people in Washington wanted, which is to take over all of Mexico, but to just get a big chunk of Mexico. And uh, it was signed on February 2nd, 1848. And uh, they had no idea when they signed the treaty, because the treaty was signed in disobedience to President Polk, there was a guy named Nicholas Trist, who had been private secretary briefly to Thomas Jefferson, who had been sent down to Mexico because he knew Spanish, and he was a clerk in the State Department at the time. And he insistently negotiated this treaty and was very focused on California, making America a continental country from one ocean to the other ocean. And, uh, they signed the treaty. They did not know at the time the treaty was signed that three days before they had discovered gold in California. <laughs> and, and, and again, for, for people to, to understand, and one of the things that I, I found is that if you talk to economists, and I, we probably have some here, part of what made America an economic power was the gold from California. Uh, because it was the largest collection stash of gold that anyone had ever found anywhere. And you know, in California, uh, it, within the first year after the discovery of gold, 300,000 people had moved there, and, and from all over the world. And again, it's, I, you know, I hate to be glorifying California in any way, but it is, it is, part, it is part of the United States of America. It was. Uh, it was. <laughs> it was. Uh, no, but I, I have to say that that story, that's one of the stories. When I read it, I, I sort of couldn't believe it. I said, this, this is outrageous. This seems inescapably planned by God. God, you know, a zillion years ago, puts gold ore under what today we call California um, and works it out so that, uh, you know, when the United States of America kind of needs a boost, we get California, we discover gold, and it changes. I mean, the story of how gold, the discovery of gold changed America's fortunes and strengthened us. I, I, I never knew that story. That's no, and, just... and, and again, there, there's so much of this. I mean, I, one of the things that I'm obsessed with is the, I'm sure we have other people here, what they use the term freak before, who are Civil War freaks, right? <laughs> 
and uh, uh, the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam, which allowed Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, he had been waiting for a Union victory, or something that looked like a Union victory. The Battle of Antietam was won, and again, this is not even in doubt. This is not argued. It was won because a corporal uh, who was marching to try to head off Robert E. Lee's invasion of Maryland uh, had uh, fallen asleep. Then he woke up uh, because they were, had to march again. They were uh, looking around. They were trying to get some coffee. He was looking for some pieces of wood so they could eat the coffee. And he found a bunch of papers wrapping four cigars. Scars I mean, looked pretty good. Those cigars had Lee's entire battle plan on it. It was General Order Number 181. And it was because of the discovery of the four cigars and the fact that a, a general who had served alongside Lee's chief of staff in the peacetime army before the war that general recognized the handwriting right. and was able to confirm that this was authentic. That allowed them to win the Battle of uh, uh, Antietam. And, and again, that was in September 17th, 1862. January 1st, 1863, the slaves are emancipated with the Emancipation Proclamation, at least the slaves who were living under the Confederacy. But change the world! You can't, and now I just have to say, and I knew this would happen, but you really can't do these stories justice in a, in a form like this because it's the details. Uh, it, it is, it, you know, we kind of think, oh, that's a coincidence. Okay. When you provide the details, as you do beautifully, it is nothing less than impossible to believe except you know it's true. But I mean, the, the, these are moments in history, you know, when we think, what if he hadn't been looking for firewood? What if he hadn't? What, what if he had? Or if he just smoked the cigars and used the uh, <laughs> used the general orders to light them? That's a I, normal thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> that the discovery of those plans. I remember when I had interviewed you about the book on my radio show a few years ago. That's the one that took my breath away, or one of them that took my breath away. But it goes, Michael, it goes on and on and on. And, and I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln recognized it. Lincoln recognized it because he had a deep sense of providential purpose right. yeah. and understood that he had a purpose. Because the whole story of Abraham Lincoln, uh, we've had presidents who have not been wealthy. But people who have been absolutely destitute, he didn't own a pair of shoes until he was 11. Uh, you know, they, again, you're talking about dirt floors in those log cabins. They, I know the reconstructions are cheerful, but Lincoln's life is a miracle. How did this happen? He, he's certainly one of the greatest writers of prose oh. in the English language, yeah. and and phenomenal. And and again, and uh, and then of course the end of Lincoln's life, where on Palm Sunday, 1865. Uh, Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox. And on Good Friday, after Holy Week, uh, Lincoln is killed and, and dies on Good Friday. And everyone at the time recognized the religious symbolism and understood that there was a message here and that there was a purpose for which all of the dying and the suffering had taken place, which is the theme of Lincoln's second inaugural address, which he had just delivered six weeks before. It's, um, now you have to trust me on this, folks. There's an entire book full of these kind of stories. It's not just a couple, because sometimes people will have two or three interesting stories and they can stretch it into a book. I've done that. There's no shame in that. Um, but you, um, have become aware of so many of these. And I, I really, part of me in reading this book and the sequel, which is equally fascinating, I'm shocked to say, it's kind of like, what are the odds Godfather II would be as good <laughs> or better? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Um, but the idea that there are this many stories, and I think 
Michael, what, what makes me, it thrills me and then it makes me angry at the same time. It's like, why don't we all know these stories? These stories are true. And how does it fall to you at this late date in our history to bring these stories uh, to people? I mean, because why don't we all like, know this? Like you, Eric, I, and, and I know this because, again, your book, If You Can Keep It, uh, is, is wonderful and obviously working on the same themes. We live at a very difficult time. We live at a time when Americans have a fundamental choice to make about the way we view our country. Should we view our country with guilt or gratitude? And again, America is so extraordinary. I mean, and the history of America is so amazing. You basically have a core choice. You can either say it's because America is corrupt and evil and vicious and exploitative and racist and selfish and sexist and uh, despoiling the environment. It's all these terrible things. America has gotten rich and powerful and gone from being a largely uninhabited, and it was, uh, wilderness continent to being the center of the world economically and culturally and militarily in every way you can find. It's either that because America is guilty or there's another aspect which is not accidental. And it seems to me that the most important point we can make with our children in teaching history is America is no accident. It's not, uh, and, and then people say, well, it's a pattern of happy accidents. One of the things that I think the most important line in the book is a pattern of happy accidents is still a pattern. <laughs> because normally if, if all of a sudden you're playing, uh, you're, you're playing with dice and you keep rolling uh, number seven or, or, or any other number, you think, well, there's a pattern here. And the pattern here was enunciated by one of my favorite quotes ever. And it's from, not an American, it's from uh, uh, Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor of Germany. He said, the good Lord has special protection for lost dogs, imbeciles, small children, drunkards, and the United States of America. <laughs> Uh, you quote that in one of these books. I, I, I do, friend. yeah. Uh, but the fact is that, I mean, this is, m many things are like this, where if you dare to look at the facts, you're going you're gonna to be troubled because there's only one conclusion. So you have uh, the opportunity to avoid the facts, um, or you're going to come to this conclusion. It, it seems to me that it, it, it becomes pretty quickly overwhelming as a conclusion. But you um, practically gild the lily by telling one story after the other. It's almost funny to me, because it would only be a handful of these, and you'd say, that settles it. It's obvious that uh, America came into being uh, in, in a way that you know it, it's, it doesn't seem conceivable. It's a coincidence. It just seems like God's hand. You know, it, I guess the point is that even these stories would make you believe in providence, would make you believe in the hand of God in history. But there are so many of these stories. That's what astonished that, me. That's, I, what, that's, that's why they, it seems to me that they're important. Because the other alternative is this idea of the 1619 Project or a, any, any of uh, that, that work, that whole worldview that suggests that America really is a, uh, has a terrible and unique guilt. And by the way, this is not to say that America hasn't done terrible things. Of course we have. And of course there have been flaws. But the, the idea that America is uniquely guilty, not uniquely great, everyone agrees America is great. Uh, Walter McDougall, who's a professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, actually he's now just a professor emeritus, but Walter McDougall says that if you look at the history of humanity for the last 500 years, the most significant development that has impacted everything in 500 years has been the rise of the United States. And it's something that no one could have predicted. There was no one, not Nostradamus, not anybody who actually said, hmm, in North America, 
uh, where there was a, yes, there was an indigenous population, but it was not, um, it, it, it was not a large population, nor was it a, a particularly advanced population. I know that's terrible and you can't say that, but uh, the, the point being that the entire story of America is so unlikely that uh, you either have to come to this con uh, conclusion of unique guilt uh, or unique uh, greatness. And by the way, one of the other stories, I've, you know who agrees with me about this and agrees with you? Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because one of the stories, the story with which I begin the second book, which is called God's Hand on America. And again, it's, it's one of those things I, I, I remember waking my wife up when I found out some of the medical details involved here. The night that Lincoln was murdered. Oh, this, yes, please, go ahead. And the night that Lincoln was murdered, his secretary of state, who had become virtually his best friend, who had a uh, house that he was renting right across from the White House, William Henry Seward, uh, the plan was by a conspiracy, and it was a real conspiracy by John Wilkes Booth, to murder President Lincoln, which he succeeded in doing, uh, and the same night to murder the vice president, where the fellow who had been assigned to do that got drunk and didn't do it, and then to also murder Secretary Seward, who was the most important, the leader of the cabinet. And now there, that's in, the, in the, the sequel to this. It is, it's the very first story. And the, the idea is Seward had literally nine days before the, the end of the war, and Lincoln had come to visit him at, because he had a terrible carriage accident. He was going out with his son and his daughter on a spring day, it was April, like now, and they went out on a carriage accident. The horses got out of control. He tried to stop the horses because he was afraid his daughter would get hurt. He fell down, he broke multiple ribs, and completely shattered his jaw. This is nine days before the assassination. Before Lincoln is assassinated. Correct. Seward and has this really accident. horrifying accident. And I, again, I had never heard this, and it, it begins the sequel to the American uh, miracle, but it, the details of that are crazy. Please okay. keep going. <laughs> sure. So uh, what they did, he cared about being able to speak again. Uh, the, the doctors all thought he was going to die. Uh, and uh, what they, they did was they fashioned a metal plate that fit underneath his jaw, tried to set his bones so they would come together again. By the way, Seward would never allow himself after this to be photographed from the left side because the jaw was so distorted. Uh, and, and they wrapped this metal plate in canvas. The night that Louis Payne, a Booth's chosen assassin, uh, forced his way into the Seward household, went up to the top floor, uh, took his Bowie knife, and it was a Bowie knife because he had used up his revolver. His revolver he had fired at Fred, uh, Seward's son, who was trying to protect his father. Uh, the revolver misfired, which doesn't happen that often. So he took the revolver and broke it over Frederick Seward's, the younger Frederick Seward's this head. Is, I just want to tell you, 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 you need to buy, after you buy this book, <laughs> You need to buy the sequel because this story, which again, we cannot do justice, it's a mind-bending story. We're just getting the, the top of it, so, so please. So Frederick Seward, who is the son of William Henry Seward, who was the assistant secretary of state, little nepotism, uh, he, he was in a coma for five weeks afterward and could not speak here and was, thought he was going to die. Pain comes up to the old man who is lying in bed with this contraption on his neck that is metal and he can't speak, he can't eat. Uh, and so he, he doesn't have the gun because he broke that over the son's head. He takes out his Bowie knife, comes down four times, stabbing for the jugular vein. There is a metal plate there. The knife blade breaks off. Seward survives. 
And because of that, Vladimir Putin says, we won the Cold War. <laughs> Why? Because Alaska, yes. right? This is your trip. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Putin makes the point that if Russia had, had retained in 1867 uh, what was known then as Russian America, they would have had missiles there and everything would have been different and Russia would have won the Cold War. He said this in the anniversary of uh, the purchase of Alaska, uh, which was uh, the last person in 1867. So we're, we're because of William Seward surviving through this strange thing. Obviously, Alaska is called Seward's Folly. Right, and um, and again, and and it's a very big part of the emergence of Seattle too, because where where we are, Seattle, the Klondike Gold Rush. That's uh, uh, the all of the travel to Alaska came through Seattle, just like you. But Seward. Um, <laughs> Uh, Seward basically had to uh, overcome tremendous opposition uh, because uh, basically Sea uh, Alaska didn't have anything. Uh, Horace Greeley, the editor, uh, called Alaska, he didn't nickname it, it hadn't been named as Alaska, it was just Russian America. He called it Walrusha as in walrus, because they said that there were more people who lived there than walruses. More, more walruses than people. Uh, more, pardon me, more <laughs> walruses than people, that's right. But in any event, a sword, now, and okay, one, one last thing, and this is just a punchline. Yeah, trying to wrap it up. Yeah. We're getting bored. <laughs> okay. No, this is, come on, this but, is okay. so beautiful. Please, give us. While he is in the middle of negotiating with this corrupt Russian count who wasn't even really Russian. Okay, we're talking about William Seward. William Henry Seward. Who, who freakishly survives four stabbings with a Bowie knife because he happened to have, I mean, it, it, right. honestly, and you, there's more to it, so you'll see. And then Seward, Seward is going through his papers. It's uh, about three weeks before they sign the bill of purchase on Alaska. And he's going through his papers and he sees there's this opportunity under the Guano Act of 1854. <laughs> the Guano this is Act. Not a joke. Yes, the please. Guano Act had provided that if American sea captains find uh, islands with guano, which was very valuable and f used for farming, if they can find that kind of island and no other nation has claimed it, uh, Americans can take possession of it. Okay, guano is the excrement of? Yes, and, so and, a and, and Act there is a Guano Act. There is a Guano Act that was passed in 1854. And because so of the Sword Guano Act of this, 1854. Uh, Seward sees that there are these little three islands uh, that uh, are exactly halfway between the United States and Japan. Okay, and so he William signs Seward, the paper. Yeah. Uh, to, to take those for the United States. It's the Midway Atoll. And now, okay, <laughs> most people, I'm guessing, aren't gonna get this. I certainly didn't get this until it was put together for me. Have I mentioned that there are two books that you have to read? <laughs> um, but I'm not kidding, it's, it's almost unbelievable stuff. The, the Midway Atoll, these, these are nothing islands in the middle of nowhere. A total of two and a half square miles. Okay, so William Seward, somehow, because of the Guano Act of 1854, decides to acquire these, now why? And Just because he knew somehow, mystically, magically, maybe he didn't, but, but let's say he knew that Admiral Yamamoto would say that if he is pushed by Tojo and the Emperor to actually do the attack on Pearl Harbor, he said that uh, for six months I will run wild, but after that uh, uh, America will destroy us. And six months after Pearl Harbor, do the math, Battle of Midway. And the Battle of Midway in five minutes, the, my chapter on Midway, and, and again, everyone involved with this, including Chester Nimitz, who was the admiral and commander, who uh, was an atheist. 
he was not a religious person, said this is the hand of God. There's no other way to explain it. <laughs> that in five minutes they sank four Japanese aircraft carriers. <laughs> and, and again, and this was at a time after our Navy had been largely but just pulverized at, at Pearl Harbor. And it was exactly six months, as Yamamoto said. And if the United States did not own Midway Island, which was with an American base on the island, and American planes at the island, the Battle of Midway would not have happened, and who knows. But who would dream that the Guano Act of 1854 <laughs> would be dispositive in World War II, <laughs> right. uh, 90 years later? It's crazy, except it's true. It, 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 and it is. And, um, and by the way, again, a lot of this stuff sounds like tall tales. Uh, but the, the, the way that I, I think you can, anyone can convince themselves, imagine if it hadn't happened. Uh, Vladimir Putin does. He, he wrote in, uh, 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 what is it, 2017 because that was the 150th anniversary of Russia giving up Russian America, that if, if only this individual, who he holds in great contempt, Frederick William Seward, had not injured his jaw because he fell out of the carriage, and then the, uh, uh, the assailant had broken his gun, beating his son nearly to death. And but it fits together. And, and again, it, it illustrates the wisdom of uh, uh, Otto von Bismarck's summary. There's a special protection, special providence for the United States of America. And by the way, it becomes more recent. Now, I didn't write about this in any detail. I do mention it. Uh, President Reagan uh, used to be known as our oldest president, um, but uh, <laughs> President, President Reagan takes a bullet that is, what was it, a quarter of an inch away from the lining of his heart? It was a very close run thing. And by the way, with uh, six weeks separation between the near assassination of the other great victor of the Cold War, His Holiness Pope John Paul II, how, what are the odds? The, these, these two old men uh, get, get bullets shot into the center of their body. They should have both died. And if they had both died, then the evil empire is uh, still in its full flowering of, of evil without the, 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 the great victory that I think that uh, America should be proud of. Uh, in, in bringing the end of the Cold War. I've been saying recently, when people question whether we can survive the current madness uh, on so many fronts, uh, you know, in the natural, the answer would be no. But in the natural, uh, the answer to the emergence of the United States and the survival and thriving of the United States also ought never to have happened. And your both books uh, l lay it out. Uh, you could just start with, uh, when you write about the, the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Brooklyn, Washington should not have prevailed. No, we he, ought he should never have been captured and hanged, uh, according to the logic of history. They had just lost the most bloody battle of the Revolution. And it was. In the eight years of the Revolutionary Conflict, 1775 to 1783, the most costly battle was the Battle of Brooklyn. Three American generals were captured. Washington's uh, troop was surrounded and uh, literally with no escape because the British Navy, and there was no American Navy at the time, the uh, British Navy was occupying the, uh, the river between Manhattan I mean, and Brooklyn. I, know, I just know enough about this because I've, I've written about this. And it, it is unbelievable. I mean, when we're talking about, yeah, the British Navy was massed there. It was the greatest assembly of military craft uh, uh, sea craft in the history of the world. Up to that time, absolutely Sitting right. next to Staten Island, waiting to crush, to crush 
the Continental Army. And to capture the George Washington and the Continental Army right after they had committed treason by authorizing the Declaration of Independence, because we're talking about the summer, August of 1776. Now, there, how many people here are New Yorkers at any time? Do we have some New Yorkers? OK, people who know New York know that in August, it very rarely has thick fog so thick that you can't see. That fog was considered by the pastors at the time, by the non-believing military people, to be an act of God because it allowed George Washington to use John Glover and his Marblehead Regiment, which was a bunch of fishermen, and to row the army, including the general in chief. They didn't lose a single person. They it, escaped. And the British, the British officers believed it was the hand of the Almighty. Well, I, just to, you know, in case anybody's not, you know, been bon boning up on the Battle of Brooklyn recently, um, it, it really is, it's extraordinary. The more you learn, the more fascinating it is. But the idea that, if you're familiar with the geography of New York, that, you know, uh, Queens, Brooklyn, th the, uh, the entire American Continental Army is on that side. They've just suffered this horrible battle. And I, I don't remember the details, but, but it's a crazy idea that Washington has that if we can take the remainder of the army and sneak it across the East River, and by the way, the East River is not a river. It's an estuary. <laughs> but it's called the East River. But that idea alone, to try to pull that off, it's, it's crazy. And he does it under cover of night. And then as the sun is rising, which is what you've just said, an absolutely preposterous, opaque fog descends so that the remainder, which is thousands of men, are able to cross to safety, enabling Washington to fight another day, to live to fight another day. So instead of being liberty being uh, strangled in its cradle, we get several more years of, of Washington fighting and ultimately winning. And I always think that's the ultimate example, really, of how it ought not to have happened. The United States ought not to have emerged. And it, the United States would not have emerged without George Washington surviving. And, and that, again, there, there are multiple books written about this because it is so bizarre. Washington seemed to be indestructible. His, his first taste of real battle was at the first major battle of the French and Indian War, where he was a militia colonel from uh, Virginia. He was 23 years old. And he, of the 70 British officers, mounted officers, he was the only one who wasn't either wounded or killed. And they shot his hat off. They found bullets through his hat. They shot two, count them, two horses out from under him. And uh, Not at the same time. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but. but to be but, clear. But the, uh, there, there was a, a, a pastor who, after Washington returned, went through this whole story. Remember, he's 23 years old. He's nobody, really. Uh, but a pastor named Burchard spoke, who later became president of Princeton. But he spoke in church, and he, he said, tried to comfort people about the losses for the battle. He said, but I want to commend that heroic youth, Colonel Washington, for surely the good Lord has singled him out for leadership of our country. Wow. Okay, so, uh, you know, That's and again, this is written country. down. And right. Right, it's when there was maybe a hope, a distant hope, that there would be a country. Well, um, you, you, you write about that beautifully. I guess, you know, the, the larger question, Michael, is th this happens to me over and over. I discover something, I discover this book and the sequel and the stories. And I'm absolutely fascinated, thrilled, amazed, astonished. 
but that quickly turns to anger. Why haven't I heard this before? This is not some abstruse topic. This is American history. And it is not less than amazing that everyone doesn't know these stories. I, I think that's absolutely right. And it's why I believe that the educational issues that you talk about, that we all talk about, needing to teach Americans about feeling gratitude uh, rather than guilt is such a tremendous priority for our children because partially they'll be better and happier people. Yeah. Grateful people are happier people. Gratitude is its one of the reasons I'm proud to say I pray every morning yeah. because basically we have so much to be grateful for. And, and let me say one thing that I, I am grateful for that I want to announce here. We, this is the first public announcement right here now. Uh, there will be a movie based on the American miracle. <laughs> that, uh, and two of the principal producers are here with us tonight, uh, uh, Ralph and, and many Jim. potential investors. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's uh, the film will be available in uh, in in 2025, and it takes the first chunk of uh, the American Miracle, and I, I hope uh, with enough success so that we can continue the rest of the stories. And, and again, we're, we're working with people at Heroic Pictures and Patterns of Evidence. People probably have seen some of the Patterns of Evidence films. And uh, I, I, my hope for the film is that the people who see it can feel as excited and inspired and literally touched, sometimes electrified, as, as I felt in finding this material. Both of us had the fortune and misfortune uh, of attending Yale University. Um, and I have to say, I don't know what it was like when you were there, but when I arrived there uh, as an innocent, uh, patriotic son of immigrants, I was uh, introduced for the first time in my life to the idea that America was a force for evil uh, that patriotism was for suckers uh, and rubes, um, naive people who live in flyover country, and that the sophisticated view, of course, was that um, you know there's nothing glorious about uh, uh, about America, and that idea, uh, of course, uh, it's unfortunately no longer. Uh, just among you know some cultural elites at places like the humanities departments at Yale, but it has worked its way into the culture. You mentioned the 1619. No, project. it's poison in the national bloodstream. It it, it just it, it it is, and and the the point is that I think it's very important that people understand it. Is that if you don't learn the truth that America is exceptional and blessed then you will embrace the falsehood that America is exceptional and cursed. And again, people take some satisfaction uh, in, in uh, uh, by listing our national shortcomings. And the point is, it's the same, same sort of thing uh, that, that I think that people find raising children is if you want your children to be happy and successful and positive and things to work out for them, then obviously having those children emphasize the positive, not the negative. Uh, nothing worse than a complaint. I shouldn't say nothing worse. A complaining children can be. Uh, uh, and, and of course, all, all, all children do, but they don't complain based upon, oh, mommy and daddy and grandpa and grandma and everybody. They're, they're so guilty. They, were, they basically had anything they had because they took it away from other people and they didn't work hard for it. Um, again, there is so much in our history that is glorious. And if I can just borrow for a moment, this is 
the, the, the most successful book of history ever, uh, ever written was by George Bancroft, who was a Republican politician. And he did a, a 10 volume history of the United States, which was ubiquitous, was published in 1876. And what he said in the beginning, in the very introduction to those 10 volumes, it is the object of the present work to explain the steps by which a favoring providence calling our institutions into being has conducted the country to its present happiness and glory. When you were learning history like that, by the way, I, I had, and I do want to mention it, I had three or four history professors at Yale who were great American patriots and poets. Um, Edmund Morgan, a, a colonial historian, uh, uh, C. Van Woodward, historian of the American South. John Morton Blum, who was an American of the, uh, uh, historian of the turn of the century, the progressive era. These guys were like old-fashioned guys. You know, the, the old time that had that idea of teaching history, that the, the reason that it's so infectious to play those little board games with all the different presidents and, and basically to learn the details of American history. Um, on the Liberty Bell, the uh, inscription on the Liberty Bell, which is from the book of Leviticus, uh, proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Uh, all of this stuff is magical, and all of the major leaders of our country, including people who weren't conservative, like Franklin Roosevelt, in some ways he was conservative, but he understood and spoke meaningfully about uh, America's destiny and what a miracle this country was. What a miracle it was, by the way, that he sur <laughs> survived uh, as, as needed to survive. And it, that's another story, is that we almost had Henry Wallace as president of the United States, okay. which would have been a... This is another thing. <laughs> when I read that in the sequel to this book, it is, again, I'm repeating myself, almost unbelievable. Henry Wallace, when you read who he was and what he believed, the idea that all logic would say that he would have become the president of the United States, and where in the world would we, would we have been? Correct, because he was a Stalinist. He, he... Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> I want to be very, very clear. Uh, any red uh, communists here, we love you, and we want you to But by the way, by back. the way, to, in fairness, and this is something, honestly, I didn't know. I did not know. At the end of his life, uh, Henry Wallace, who had been vice president, and then Roosevelt threw him off the ticket and replaced him with Harry Truman. Wow. And that was a, an amazing thing. What I didn't know until researching this book is um, that at the, one of the last things he wrote before he died was why I was wrong. Henry and Wallace. Henry Wallace. When I read a, that, I, my heart leapt because I thought, you never hear that kind of a story. A guy who was outrageously, wickedly wrong, who at the end of his life effectively repented. And, and talks about how he was brainwashed, literally, by Russians when they gave him tours, and they hid the prison camps. And in any event, it's, it's, it's uh, ex extraordinary uh, how these things turned. And the, the conspiracy. Uh, and it was a conspiracy of the, uh, and they all happened to be Catholic believers, uh, to replace Henry Wallace with Truman, who they knew that Truman was someone, and this is 1945 we're talking about, who was right about Stalin and about what uh, the Soviet state was. And about as pro-Israel as you could ever hope uh, which would bring us into a conversation about not the almost chosen people, but about the chosen people. They're not unrelated subjects. We've been talking about um, is there meaning in history? Uh, is God involved in history? Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to say uh, on behalf of uh, 
Socrates in the city, uh, Michael Medved, we are just hugely grateful to you, not just for appearing here with us and telling us these stories, but for writing uh, what are two genuinely great books, which you must read. You must share these stories with others. We cannot survive uh, as a nation, as a free people, unless we know this history and celebrate it. Uh, and for your part in that, Michael Medved, I say thank you. Thank you.